Who was Leonardo da Vinci? Some people are enormously talented. And then there is Leonardo da Vinci. He lived at a time when there were many extremely talented people all around him. Even so, he stood out. He could draw and paint better than anyone. One of his paintings, the Mona Lisa, is the most famous painting in the world. He was a scientist hoping to unlock the secrets of the natural world. He was an engineer, an inventor. He designed a bicycle that would have worked 300 years before the first bike was actually built. He was an excellent athlete, a fine musician, and he was handsome. Although there are no known paintings of him, whenever people of the day described him, they always mentioned his good looks. I want to work miracles, he stated, yet he often met with failure. And while he could be charming, he mistrusted almost everyone. He was a loner. He had no family of his own. For 16 years, he didn't even have a home of his own. By his own standards, Leonardo was a disappointment. He never reached the goals he set for himself. His greatest works were left unfinished. Nevertheless, what he did achieve in 67 years still sets the standard for human excellence. It's hard to imagine someone doing better. On April 15th, 1452, in a tiny hill town in Italy, a baby boy was born. His father was a well-to-do businessman, San Piero. His mother, Caterina, was a poor young peasant girl. We don't even know her last name. Their baby was named Leonardo. Because the town he came from was called Vinci, he was called Leonardo da Vinci. That means Leonardo from Vinci. Leonardo's parents were not married. His father was ashamed of the baby and left him with his mother. Sir Piero married another woman, someone more respectable, and started a new family. He moved nearby to the busy city of Florence. Caterina did not want to keep her baby either. She cared for him for only a year or two. Then she, too, married someone else and began a new family. So what was to become of little Leonardo? Ser Piero's answer was to leave the baby with his parents. But Leonardo's grandparents were old. His grandfather was 85 at the time. At their age, what did they want with a toddler? Still, they took him in. They fed him, clothed him, and gave him a home, but little else. No one loved the little boy. The only person who showed interest in him was an uncle named Francesco. Francesco was a farmer, and he loved the beautiful countryside around Vinci. He would take long walks in the hills, which were covered with olive trees. Leonardo would go with him. It was there on these walks that Leonardo grew to love the natural world, the rolling shapes of the hills, the silvery leaves of the olive trees, the flight of birds, and the soft, misty sunlight. Everywhere he went, Leonardo took a little notebook with him. He made drawings of anything that interested him. A plant, ducks in a stream, flowers and insects, some cows. Paper was very valuable, but Leonardo was lucky. Because of his father's business, there was always a supply. It was one of the most important things Ser Piero gave his son. Even when he was a young boy, Leonardo had an amazing talent for drawing. Drawing seemed to flow out of his fingers onto the paper. His rabbits and birds didn't look like drawings. They looked alive. He understood the beauty of nature. He also knew its dangers. When he was only four years old, a terrible hurricane struck the countryside. Farms were destroyed and many people were killed. Then, when he was 10, the Arno River flooded Florence. Leonardo watched the storm and saw the flood. He never forgot all his life. He drew pictures of moving water. Water was a source of life for animals and plants. It was also a source of destruction. Leonardo wanted to understand both sides of this force and to control its power. His father must have been aware of his son's gift for drawing. All it would have taken was one look at one sketch. Ser Piero was a practical man. He knew Leonardo's choices in life were limited. 
Because Ser Piero never married Caterina, Leonardo could not attend a university. He could not be a lawyer and businessman like his father. He could not become a doctor, but he could work in one of the art studios in Florence. Being an artist was a respectable trade. Ser Piero decided to take Leonardo to the city. There, he arranged for him to live and work with a famous artist. His name was Andrea del Vero Verrocchio. This was certainly the best thing Ser Piero ever did for his son. It changed Leonardo's life forever. During the 1400s, Florence was the most important, most exciting city in all the world. It was one of five city-states in what is now Italy. Because the city-state meant Florence had its own government, it was called the Signoria. But for many years, the city was really ruled by one very rich, very powerful family called the Medici. The Medici men were art lovers. They built beautiful homes and churches and libraries in Florence. They wanted works of art to go inside all those buildings. Andrea del Verrocchio was one of the most famous artists working in Florence at the time. He had plenty of jobs. Leonardo was very lucky to study under such a master. Leonardo was an apprentice. He was 12. At the time he went to Verrocchio's studio, all apprentices were boys. No girls were allowed. The apprentices were not paid, but they were given free room and free food and a little money. At the studio, they learned to become artists. For the first year, they had classes in drawing. After about seven or eight years, they knew how to paint pictures, create frescoes, make statues out of marble or bronze, design pottery, silverware, objects of gold, and even design buildings. Apprentices started at the bottom and worked their way up. They swept the studio, ran errands for the older artists, and cleaned up at the end of the day. There were no art supply stores, so Leonardo and the other apprentices learned to make paintbrushes and paints. For the brush hairs um, from different animals were stuck into wooden handles. Hog bristles, for instance, made good hard brushes. Squirrel fur was used for softer brushes. The artist painted with a kind of paint called tempera. It was an egg, not oil. Its base was an egg, not oil. Painting with oil paints first started in the Netherlands in Italy. In Netherlands. In Italy, artists did not start using oil paint until the 1470s. Leonardo was taught to make colors. Blue came from grinding a stone called lapis lazuli into dust. Red came from crushing tiny beetles. Yellow came from the juice of one kind of berry. At that time, canvas was not used for paintings. An artist painted on a flat panel of wood instead, but the wood had to be prepared first. Boiling kept it from splitting or cracking later on. Then glue was brushed on. After that, a coat of fine plaster called gesso was put on. This gave the panel a nice, smooth surface for painting. All these steps were jobs for the apprentices. Benocchio's studio was always busy. At one time, the master and his assistants would be working on many different projects. No, girl. Whatever Vecchio's customers ordered, they'd make. As head of the studio, Verrocchio ran the business and drew up the contracts. The contract said exactly what the job was to be. For example, a statue of a soldier on horseback, how long it would take to finish it, how much it would cost, and what materials would be used. Marble was more expensive than wood. Using wafer-thin pieces of gold, called gold leaf, on a painting added to its cost. And only Verrocchio, the master, signed the works of art. Right away, Verrocchio saw that young Leonardo had a special talent. He was a natural, so soon after he learned the basics of the trade, Leonardo was allowed to do more important work. Customers, or patrons as they were called, often gave religious paintings to one of the important churches in Florence. A painting might be of Mary and the baby Jesus in the manger with Joseph and the wise men and shepherds. Sometimes the patron would have his wife and himself put into the picture too. 
They might appear at the sides, kneeling and praying. They were almost always smaller in size than the saints. On Sundays, when people came to church, they saw the beautiful painting of Mary and her baby and the patron who had paid for it. It was a lovely gift to the church. It also showed how rich and important the patrons were. Verrocchio received a commission to do a painting of the baptism of Jesus. In it, Jesus is standing in a rocky stream. St. John pours water over his head. At the left in the painting are two angels. Verrocchio himself painted almost everything except one of the angels. The angels, the angel is staring at Jesus in a way that shows he understands the importance of what he is watching. His face is sweet and wise. Leonardo painted the angel and he is so full of life that everything else in the painting looks stiff. Verrocchio realized Leonardo was a genius. He had talent like no one he had <coughs> ever seen before. Verrocchio understood that even he himself was not as good as his young apprentice. The story is that after he saw Leonardo's angel, Verrocchio never took up a paintbrush again. He went on to do more statues and items of gold, but he never did anything else. Leonardo stayed at Verrocchio's workshop a long time, 13 years. He became a master and a member of the guild, but he didn't move out to start a studio of his own. Perhaps Verrocchio's studio felt like a home to Leonardo, a place where he belonged and was wanted. Verrocchio was a kind master and the two were probably quite close. Florence was also an exciting place to live. It was full of new ideas it was also a city with books, lots of books. Until the mid 1400s, there were no printed books. Every book was copied by hand. Sometimes beautiful pictures were painted on the pages. The result was a work of art in itself, but it took a long time to make a single book. Then around 1450 in Germany, a man named Johannes Gutenberg made a discovery. He figured out how to build a printing press. It used letters made of pieces of steel. They could be moved around to create words. An inked page of type could be printed out on paper many times. The Bible was considered the most important book. So the first title printed was a Bible. Very quickly, however, other books were printed as well. Books on math, books on maps, books by great thinkers of the past like Plato and Aristotle. With more books available, more people started learning to read. As a child, Leonardo had been taught to read and write. He also knew simple math, <clears throat> but that wasn't enough for him. He wanted to learn about everything. He couldn't attend a university, but he could teach himself. So he started buying and collecting books. <clears throat> he continued to do this all his life. Artists needed math in order to make paintings look three-dimensional. In the Middle Ages, paintings didn't look realistic. The people in them looked flat, like a king or a queen on a playing card. The buildings looked flat too, like pieces of scenery in a play. But in the 1400s, an artist named Filippo Bruna, Brunelleschi figured out a way to make paintings appear to have depth. A person looking at a painting would be tricked into thinking it was something in real space. For instance, figures close up had to be much bigger than figures that were supposed to be far away. This is called painting in perspective. A painter needed math to measure out the correct spaces for figures on the wood panels. Leonardo was a great painter because he followed the rules and then made rules of his own. There was magic in his fingers. He blurred hills and valleys in the background of a painting just a little bit. It looked as if they were blending into the sky. This is exactly how faraway mountains appeared to our, our eyes. They don't have sharp details or sharp outlines. In 1478, when Leonardo was about 26 years old, he completed a whole painting. It is a scene of the Annunciation. The Annunciation was when an angel appeared to Mary. He told her what she was going to have, a son named Jesus. In Leonardo's painting, Mary is wearing clothes that a woman of the time would have worn. The landscape 
Oh, she was sitting in a walled garden. The landscape in the background looked very much like the hills of Vinci. The picture is very beautiful, and yet it also has drama. The Annunciation is one of only 13 paintings that experts are sure that Leonardo painted, and three of those 13 are not finished. Why did he paint so few? It wasn't that he died young. He lived well into his 60s. He was not lazy. He loved to work. For the Annunciation, he did dozens of drawings beforehand. Every curl of hair had to be right, every blade of grass. Perhaps Leonardo finished other paintings that may have gotten lost. Someday, in the future, a Leonardo painting may be found in a tiny church or a castle. That would be a great gift for the whole world. But the fact is that Leonardo had trouble sticking with a project. If he got an order for a painting, the first steps interested him the most. He liked figuring out how to group the figures on the panel. That part was a challenge, like fitting together all the pieces of a puzzle. But finishing a painting, filling in the colors, was not as exciting. So very often he left his work undone. Also, his patrons could be fussy, and Leonardo did not like what to be told to do. Be told what to do. He was a genius after all. In 1478, Florence was not the peaceful, pleasant city it had been. The Medici family and other powerful families were at war with each other. There were plots to kill the Medici rulers. The streets were dangerous. At age 30, Leonardo decided it was time for a change. He left Florence to go north to Milan, another city-state. There he hoped to work for the ruler of Milan, a scheming duke named Ludovico Sforza. Milan was a famous university, had a famous university, but it was not a center for famous artists like Florence was. Ludovico Sforza was very interested in the arts. The Duke liked to give big parties. He liked to put on pageants. He also wanted someone to design new weapons for him. All of this interested Leonardo. He wrote a letter to the Duke. In it, he listed everything he was good at. Some of it was bragging. He said he could design buildings and bridges, warships and huge cannons. Nobody knows if Leonardo ever sent the letter. There also is a story about a present that Leonardo gave the Duke. The Duke loved music. Leonardo did too. So he made a lute. This was a violin with strings like a bow, with strings and a bow. It was made of silver and was in the shape of a horse's skull. It had to be played upside down. Whether this is true or not, one thing is certain. The Duke did eventually hire Leonardo. So off Leonardo went to Milan. Whatever the Duke wanted, Leonardo would create. He worked for the Duke for many years until the Duke was forced from power. When the Duke's nephew was married, there was a huge feast. Leonardo was in charge of the party after the feast. He built incredible stage sets. They were for a play known as the Feast of Paradise. What a spectacle it must have been. A mountain was split in two. Inside it was a beautiful model of the heavens. Actors in fancy costumes represented the different planets. The 12 signs of the zodiac were lit by torches. Everything was turned around and round. Some of Leonardo's work was much more practical. He found a better way to heat the water for the Duchess's bath. He also built a series of canals. Another project was something Leonardo worked on for years and was never able to finish, even at the end of his life. He was still dreaming about his horse. The Duke wanted a giant statue of a horse. The statue was to honor the memory of his father. He didn't want it to just be big. He wanted it to be huge, the biggest ever. For years, Leonardo made sketches of how the horse statue might look. He studied the horses in the Duke's stable. He made wax models. He even cut into the muscles and bones of dead horses. He wanted to know horses inside and out. Leonardo's horse was to be more than three times the size of a real horse. Its front right leg would be lifted. It would be made of bronze. 80 tons of metal were needed for a statue this big. After 10 years on the project, Leonardo finished a full-sized model of the horse in clay. It stood in the courtyard of the Duke's castle. It was 24 feet high. Now everyone in Milan came to see what the statue would look like, and they all agreed. There had never been anything like it, but Leonardo still had much work ahead of him. He had molds 
from clay for the different parts of the statue. After that, hot bronze would be poured into the molds. This was gonna be a very tricky process too. If the metal wasn't poured fast enough, it would crack as it grew hard. But Leonardo figured out how to avoid the cracking. The Duke collected all the metal that Leonardo needed. It really seemed as if the fabulous bronze statue would be made, but Leonardo never got to use the metal for his horse. By 1494, the Duke was afraid that soldiers from France were going to attack. What happened to all that bronze? The Duke made it into cannons. Even so, the cannons did not stop the French. They took over Milan in 1499. And what happened to Leonardo's giant clay horse? The French used it for target practice. They shot arrows into it until it was completely destroyed. There was nothing left of all those long years of work. Leonardo's dream turned into dust. It was not Leonardo's fault that the horse was never finished. However, another important job for the Duke also came to an unhappy end. And this time, Leonardo was partly to blame. Near the Duke's castle was a monastery, a place where monks lived and prayed and studied. The Duke planned to be buried there one day. He wanted Leonardo to paint a picture on one of the walls in the dining hall. This kind of painting is called a fresco. The most beautiful kind of fresco is also the hardest kind of painting to do. Water-based paint is put directly onto fresh plaster that hasn't dried. In Italian, fresco means fresh. The artist must work quickly, and once the paint is brushed on, the artist can't go back and make changes. The dining hall in the monastery was a very large room. It was big enough for 50 monks to eat in. Leonardo decided to choose a scene from the end of Jesus' life. He and his 12 followers are shown at a dinner table. This is a good choice for a painting in the dining hall. It was a very dramatic moment. Jesus tells his followers that one of them is going to betray him. Leonardo made many drawings of ways to show 13 figures seated at a table. He wandered through the streets of Milan looking for people to put in a fresco. The fresco was to be painted on the wall so that it seemed to be part of the dining hall. It would be almost as if Jesus and his followers were in the same room with the monks. Even the table and the dishes in the painting were the same kind the monks used. The fresco is called the Last Supper. It is one of the most famous works of art in the world. Gentlemen from Milan would travel to the monastery to watch Leonardo paint. He didn't mind. In fact, he liked to hear their opinions of the picture. A 17-year-old boy often came to watch, too. He grew up to be a writer and left accounts of the Last Supper. He wrote that sometimes Leonardo would come into the dining hall very early in the morning. He would paint the entire day from sunrise to sunset. He would not even stop to eat or drink anything. Then, on other days, he would stand in front of the painting and scold himself. It wasn't good enough. And sometimes he would dash in from working on the horse statue. He would make one or two brush strokes and then leave. In the fresco, Jesus is shown in the center with six men on either side of him. He looks very calm but sad. The followers react to his news with horror. Each side seems to back away from him like a shockwave. One of the men, however, seems separated from the group. He is leaning forward, his arm on the table. His name is Judas, and he is the one who will betray Jesus. By 1479, the Last Supper was completed. It was so lifelike and so dramatic. All over Italy, people talked about this beautiful, moving painting. Leonardo was known as one of the greatest masters of his day. Copies of The Last Supper were made by other artists. Engravings were made for people all over Europe to buy. 500 years later, it is still considered a work of genius. So why isn't this a happy ending? It's because of damage done to the painting. The Last Supper started to crack and peel less than 50 years after Leonardo finished it. It was Leonardo's fault. Leonardo didn't like working on frescoes the regular way. He wanted to be able to go back and make changes, so instead he tried something new. He put varnish on the wall and then painted it with tempera paints. Tempera paints. Leonardo was always experimenting. This was one experiment that was a big mistake. Today, much of the wall painting has flaked off Many of the faces are only half there. 
The colors are faded. Experts have tried to restore The Last Supper. They have made improvements. Still, there's a great deal of damage to this masterpiece. It's probably lucky that Leonardo can't see how it looks. The Duke was a good patron to Leonardo for many years. He kept Leonardo busy. He also let him take jobs from other rich people in Milan. It was in Milan that Leonardo took in a poor 10-year-old boy. The year was 1490. The boy's name was Giacomo, but Leonardo called him Salai, Salai, Salai. This was slang word meaning rascal or demon. Salai was indeed a rascal. He lied, he broke things, he stole money from Leonardo and Leonardo's friends. In his notebook, Leonardo wrote that Salai, I wish I knew how to say that correctly, ate as much as two boys and made as much trouble as four. Even so, Leonardo was very fond of him. He enjoyed spoiling him with presents, no matter how badly he behaved. Leonardo never asked him to leave. Sally stayed with him for the rest of Leonardo's life. Wherever Leonardo traveled, he went to. He may have done chores for Leonardo, but he was much more important to him than a servant. Leonardo was not close to many people. He enjoyed being alone, free to think. He never had a family of his own. Perhaps Salai was the one person who was almost like family. In 1499, when the French attacked, attacked, the Duke lost his power. He fled Milan. Then later on, he was captured. He died a prisoner in France. In December of that year, Leonardo left Milan. Salai went with him. So did another old friend. Leonardo did not have a real home again for 16 years. He took very little with him as he traveled from place to place. Only the most important things did he keep with him, like his notebooks. In Milan, he had started keeping notebooks full of drawings and ideas. Leonardo kept filling up notebooks for more than 30 years. His plan was to write an encyclopedia about everything, like the horse statue. This was another great big project. And like the horse statue, it was a job never completed. However, the notebooks are still priceless treasures. The pages are illustrated with beautiful drawings of everything that had interested Leonardo. They are among the most beautiful drawings in the world. They were probably, there probably were a total of about 13,000 notebook pages. But after his death, many were torn out and sold. Some notebooks were cut apart, some disappeared, some were rediscovered hundreds of years later. Today, there are 10 different collections of Leonardo's notebook pages. Only half the pages, about 6,000 pages, are known to exist. They are in different places all over the world. There's always the hope that someday another notebook page will turn up. Bill Gates, the founder of Microsoft, bought one collection of pages. It is all about water. It is called Codex... Atlanticus. Sometimes it is displayed in museums. In it are drawings of waves and currents, drawings of ripples in water, drawings of a drop of water as it splashes into a puddle. Leonardo's eyes were so sharp he could see all by himself what today's high-speed cameras can reveal. There are experiments that Leonardo did with water. In all the notebooks, his handwriting is reversed. This is called mirror writing. A mirror must be held up to the writing before it reads correctly. Why did Leonardo write this way? Nobody knows. He was left-handed, so maybe writing this way came most easy to him. Or he may have wanted to make it hard for anybody else to read the pages. Maybe he worried that other people might steal his ideas. Maybe he just wanted to keep his ideas secret. Leonardo's interest in water went all the way back to his childhood from the storms he saw, but water was only one of the subjects he planned to cover in his encyclopedia. He wanted to understand and explain light. What was it made of? He wanted to understand how eyesight works, why birds can fly, and all the different parts of the human body. He came up with a list of about 20 big subjects. Just one page of a notebook might have little drawings of bird wings and feathers, along with sketches about music and ideas for new weapons or sketches on building dam building dams. Leonardo never stuck to one subject. 
He'd go back and forth among many. The notebook pages are crammed with writings and beautiful drawings. It is almost as if whatever jumped into his mind, he put down on the page. What the notebook reveals is the mind of a true genius. Leonardo was interested in all kinds of machines. Machine parts interested him too. Screws and hinges and joints and hooks. It may be strange to think of a drawing of a door hinge as beautiful, but when Leonardo drew one, it was. He wanted to invent vehicles for people to use on land, in the air, even underwater. He, his design for a bicycle used a chain, just like they do today. He designed a parachute and something like a submarine. One of his drawings shows a flying machine with a rotor blade at the top. It was meant to twirl around and round like a helicopter. Leonardo was sure that one day people would fly. He said, it lies within the power of man to make this instrument. The story is that Leonardo would go to the marketplace where he would buy birds in cages. Then he'd bring them home and set them free. How did they flap their wings? What made them fly? Why were they able to land safely without breaking their legs? He longed to discover the answers. He made lots of drawings of bird wings and how feathers grew on wings. He studied bats too, and he made drawings of their wings. He tried to make wings for people that worked by using pulleys, cranks, wheels, and shock absorbers. One drawing had a pair of back pedals and a hand crank to make the wings work. Another, using another pair, a person would have had to flap the wings using muscle power. The wings or bones would be made of wood, the muscles from leather and the skin from cloth. Did Leonardo actually build any wings? Did anyone try them out? Nobody is sure. In his notebooks, he mentions testing the wings on a hill near Florence. If so, he may have jumped from the top of a hill and glided in the air for a little while, but he could not have flown. The wings would not have worked for more than one reason. First, they were too heavy. Also, it takes a lot of force to lift a heavy object off the ground and keep it in the air. The force of human power was not strong enough. And in Leonardo's days, engines with strong power had not been invented. Of course, Leonardo was right. People did learn to make flying machines, but it didn't happen until December of 1903. That is when the Wright brothers' airplane flew for 12 seconds. That was almost 400 years after Leonardo died. He was way ahead of his time. For a while, Leonardo worked for another duke in Italy. His name was Caesar Borgia. He was a very power hungry and th bloodthirsty. Leonardo designed weapons for the duke's troops to use in battle. Leonardo did not believe in war and referred to it as a disease but he did enjoy designing new and better war machinery. Some of the weapons look like something you'd see in a fantasy movie. There is one of a giant sized crossbow. It could shoot several arrows at one time. It was so big that several soldiers would have to operate it. He also designed a strange contraption with long blades jutting from it. It was supposed to strap onto a horse. The rider would attack his enemies who could not get close enough to hurt him hurt them. Leonardo thought of the human body as a machine too. In fact, he considered it the most perfect machine. Leonardo wanted to understand the human body in the same way he came to understand his horses, inside and out. He wanted to figure out how all the different parts of the body work together. The best way to do this was to dissect bodies. This meant cut into a dead body. Peeling back different layers reveals how the body is built. Today, medical students learn about the body by doing dissections. Sometimes doctors do dissections to understand why a person died, but Leonardo's time was very different. Medical students rarely ever did a dissection. They learned from books instead. The work of cutting into a dead body was considered too horrible. Leonardo, however, was determined to see for himself. When he lived in Milan, he had done some dissections of bodies. He wasn't a doctor or a medical student, so what, was he do what he was doing was illegal. Later in his life, he returned to Florence several times. There again, he did more dissections. It is believed he worked on about 30 bodies. What he learned from them was put down in his notebooks. The drawings he did of the human body are astounding. In Florence, he had a workshop in his hospital. 
He worked at night and he worked alone. The work was indeed disgusting. He hated it, but he did it anyway. The drawings were not discovered until long after Leonardo died. Nothing like them had been ever seen before. The drawings of a foot, for example, show up from three sides, moving in different ways. Leonardo also did cutaway drawings. He would draw a foot from one part, where one part had no skin. This was to let the muscles underneath show through. He'd draw muscles to look like strings or ropes. This was a good way to show which a muscle, which way a muscle pulled a limb. He'd also leave out some of the muscle to show the bone. With these drawings, there is no need for words. The drawings are better than words. They show everything exactly as it appears. If the body was a machine, then it should be possible to build a mechanical man. In 1495, Leonardo made a design for the first robot. There is some evidence that he built it too. His robot was a full-size knight in armor that could sit up, move its head, and wave its arms. Again, Leonardo was hundreds of years ahead of his time. Leonardo was one of the greatest artists of the Renaissance, but he was not alone. The Renaissance in Italy was such a special time because it produced so many talented artists. Besides Leonardo, two other great artists belong, names belong to Raphael and Michelangelo. Raphael was a great admirer of Leonardo's. Michelangelo was not. He didn't like Leonardo and Leonardo didn't like him. It's hard to imagine two men who were more different. Michelangelo came from a well-off family but did not wash or change his clothes often. He slept on the floor of his studio. He was also short, had a crooked back and a quick temper. Leonardo was handsome, well-dressed, neatly groomed and charming. 27 years younger than Leonardo, Michelangelo had become famous for his huge statue of David. Leonardo didn't think the statue was all that great, or at least that's what he said. In turn, Michelangelo made fun of Leonardo in public for never finishing his huge statue. He said, you made a model of a horse you could never cast in bronze and, and you gave up to your shame and the stupid people of Milan had faith in you. When both were asked to paint a wall in the main government building of Florence, it became a fierce contest. The walls were to picture different scenes from famous battles from Florence that Florence had won. Again, the paintings were to be frescoes, pictures painted directly onto the wall. Remember the last time Leonardo's The Last Supper didn't last very long. The room was giant size, and Leonardo's fresco was to measure about 60 feet by 24 feet. He began by making drawings. He wanted a scene full of action with horses rearing and soldiers fighting. The horror of war could come through the dead too. The wounded howling in pain, the dust and dirt and blood. After Leonardo decided on, on the design, he made a cartoon, which was transferred onto the wall. Then he set up a scaffold with a platform that could move. This would allow him to work in comfort. The trouble was, Leonardo still did not want to make a fresco in the usual way. Once again, he tried an experiment. He found a way to use oil paints with coal fires to make the paint dry quickly. He had tested out the experiment on a wall in his studio and it had worked. But the test was done on a small paint covered area. Leonardo needed it to work on a great big areas and it did not. If the fires were placed too close to the painting, it melted. If they were placed far away, there wasn't enough heat to make it dry. The top part of the battle scene ended up black with smoke. Other parts ran. After three years of hard work, Leonardo was left with nothing but a great big mess. As for Aunt Michelangelo, he did not finish his wall either. Maybe that was some comfort for Leonardo. In 1504, Michelangelo was called to Rome by the Pope to start other jobs. One was to paint the ceiling of the Pope's chapel. We know it as the Sistine Chapel. Leonardo's Ladies, Chapter 7. Not everything in Leonardo's career ended in failure. Sometimes he actually finished a job. It is true that only 10 completed paintings are known to be by Leonardo. There, that's a tiny number. 
but each and every one is a treasure. The story is that in 1505, a rich silk merchant wanted a portrait of his wife. He asked Leonardo to paint it. Leonardo had told friends that he had grown weary of the paintbrush. He meant that paintings didn't bring him much joy anymore, but perhaps he needed the money, or perhaps the woman's face caught his interest, especially her smile. Whatever the reason, Leonardo took the job and he finished the painting, although he worked on it for many years. Nobody knows for sure what the woman's name was. Her first name may have been Lisa. She may have been Lisa del Giacondo. In English, the painting is called the Mona Lisa. In the portrait, only the top half of Mona Lisa's body is shown. Behind her is a landscape. A winding road leads to a craggy mountain that appears, disappears in mist. Mona Lisa's black dress is very simple and she does not wear fancy jewelry. A thin black veil covers her long curling hair. Then, as now, it was the custom for widows to wear black. So perhaps Mona Lisa was not the wife of a silk merchant. Perhaps she was someone else about whom we know nothing. It is one of the mysteries surrounding the painting. Her hands are crossed and rest one on top of the other. They are very graceful with soft, long fingers. Looking at them is easy to believe there is muscle and bone beneath the skin. It is possible to forget that her hands are just brush strokes of paint on a flat surface, but it is the expression on her face that draws people to her. Her lips are pressed together in a calm half smile. She looks as if she is keeping a secret. Her eyes are full of mystery too. They appear to look out at something that only she can see. The Mona Lisa is probably the most famous painting in the world. Why? No one can really answer that question, but Leonardo loved the painting too. When he was finished, he decided to keep it. In fact, he kept it with him wherever he went for the rest of his life. Many people consider another portrait of a woman by Leonardo even more beautiful than the Mona Lisa. It is called Young Girl with Ermine, Ermine, Ermine. And Ermine, or, or Ermine, Ermine, let's go Ermine, I don't know. Let's just skip the word now, is a type of weasel. In winter, its coat turns white, just as it appears in the painting. The hairs were used, or er, Ermine hairs were used for paintbrushes. So it's possible that Leonardo create, painted it with a, that kind of brush. Why is it in the picture? It may be there as a play on words. The young girl's name was Cecilia Gallerani, and Gale in Greek means erm, ermine, ermine. As in the Mona Lisa, only the top half of the girl is painted, but there is no landscape behind her. She stands against a dark, solid background. Neither she nor the animal looks directly at the viewer. Instead, her face is turned so that she is gazing off to the side. At what or at whom, no one knows. She wears richer clothes than the Mona Lisa's. A long strand of beads is looped around her neck. Her dress is part blue, part red, with gold lining and black trim. The fabric looks as if it's made of velvet. Mona Lisa is dreamy looking. The young lady here looks like she has a quick, sharp mind. You can see it in her alert eyes, the set of her mouth and chin. One hand holds the ermine closely against her shoulder. It looks alert and intelligent too. The girl's hand is beautiful. It's painted to perfection, but her thin fingers are tense. Mona Lisa's fingers are plump and relaxed. Through the poses and the faces, Leonardo catches the soul of two very different women. Young girl with ermine is not as famous as the Mona Lisa. It hangs in a museum in Krakow, Poland. The Mona Lisa is in the Louvre a famous museum in Paris where crowds come every day to see her. Which painting is more beautiful? People lucky enough to see both must decide that for themselves. Another Leonardo portrait of a young woman is in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. It is the only painting by Leonardo in the U.S. Her name was Genereva de Benci. It is even smaller than the Mona Lisa or Young Girl with Ermine. The bottom was cut off at some point, so now the painting shows only Ginevra's head and chest. Her skin is almost ghostly pale. Her eyes seem sorrowful. It is very hard to read her expression. 
That is one of the reasons why people keep looking at the painting. It's haunting. In 1504, Leonardo's father, Ser Piero, died. He was 78 years old. There was no will, and Leonardo ended up receiving nothing. All the money went to Ser Piero's other children. Then in 1507, Leonardo's uncle, Francesco, died. He had been the only relative to show him any affection. He did have a will. Everything was left to Leonardo. Francesco wanted Leonardo to have all his land and money, but Leonardo's half-brothers and sisters were furious. They went to court. What Leonardo ended up getting after the use of Francesco's land and money, what Leonardo ended up getting was the use of Francesco's land and money. After Leonardo died, it would all go to his relatives. Leonardo was almost 60. He had health problems. He had no home and not all that much to show for his many years of work. But at a time when he needed a patron, one appeared. The man appreciated Leonardo for the genius he was. He provided him with a lovely home and garden. He let Leonardo bring along Salai and his other good friend, Francesco Melzi. All the man asked of Leonardo was his company. The man also happened to be a king. King Francis I of France had a grand house in Ambois. That's in the northern part of France. Leonardo was given a beautiful brick and limestone house to live in. He brought along his book collection, his notebooks, and three of his paintings. One of them was the Mona Lisa. A tunnel connected the two houses. Each day he was in Ambois, the king would come to visit and talk. He would pick a subject and ask Leonardo's opinion. The king evidently felt it was an honor simply to be in Leonardo's presence. And so Leonardo finished out his life in France. On May 2nd, 1519, he died. One story says he died in the king's arms. Another says that his last words were about his horse statue. If only he had been able to complete it. He was buried in a chapel in Ambois. It may not be a happy ending, but it isn't a sad one either. The end.